How about now? Hey, all right. Good morning and great to see you. Happy Independence Day. Thank you so much for spending your 4th of July with us here at Bethany. I know there are a lot of places that you could have been, but thank you for coming here this morning and worshiping our Lord with us and setting a tone for the rest of your Independence Day and hopefully Independence Day weekend. Uh, if I can, let's let me draw your attention to a few things and let's look through our bulletin. Uh, the first thing I'd like to ask of you is if you would take this perforated flap on the edge and just tear that off for me, I sure would appreciate it. And if you will, fill this out and put it in the offering plate as it is passed later in the service. We'd love to know how to follow up with you. We'd love to know if you've been a member for years, but you've got some updated info. This is the best way to let us know that. Please fill that out. You can also sign up on the bottom here in this little box, the bottom of the front side, you can sign up for Pray and Go. Let me assure you that everybody sitting here this morning is capable of doing what we will do with Pray and Go. You show up on Saturday morning, we'll have a light breakfast, and then we will go out into the community. We will pray over homes. We'll have a sample prayer for you. We'll have a little insert that you can use. And then there's a little door hanger that you leave on the door to let that family know that our church is praying for them and does care about them. It is a very simple, non-invasive, easy thing to do. We're asking you to talk to the Lord. We're not asking you to talk to strangers even. Like you, you don't have to actually talk to another human being except for the people with you. I, I know for us, my family and I, we're all gonna go together. Your kids can do this with you. It is inclusive of the whole family. It is just a way for us to begin reaching back out to our community in a physical way once again. I know that COVID restricted us in a lot of ways, but as COVID continues to hopefully become less and less of an issue, we want to begin reaching out by blanketing our community with prayer. So please join us on July 24th. Make note in your calendar and be there. You'll probably be done by early afternoon. We'll have a lunch. We'll feed you breakfast. We'll feed you lunch. And all you got to do is go out and pray. So Please let us know if you're willing to participate and sign up on that little uh, part of the flap right there. Put that you'll be down and put how many are joining you so we'll know how much food to order. On the back side, you'll see our nursery volunteer schedule. So if that's you, feel free to tear that part off and keep it so you can put it on your fridge or, or notify you in some way. You may or may not have noticed, but these days, if you are volunteering to help with our children's ministry in almost any capacity, you're gonna get a postcard in the mail. You're gonna get a reminder phone call the week of. You're gonna get this little bit in the tear off of the bulletin, and it's gonna be posted on social media. So there, there really isn't a lot of reason to be like missing your day okay if you if you are swapping days that's great but please just pay attention to when it is your week it helps immensely thank you for being willing to volunteer but listen if you miss out it causes a huge scramble and sets a whole a whole catastrophe of dominoes falling so please make sure that if you can be there for your times be there for your times and be notified about those then my favorite part my favorite part's the part where you can write down a prayer request Every week, Jason and I get together and we pray through these prayer requests. This is not arbitrary. This is not something that's just a gimmick or anything like that. This is us genuinely wanting to pray with you and for you. There's nothing too big. There's nothing too small. Please let us know how we can pray for you. Drop that in the offering plate as it is passed by. We've already talked about pray and go. We've already talked about a lot of things. Just know that there's a lot of good stuff going on with Bethany Kids. This coming Wednesday is that World Song Missions Adventure Camp at I Know. So pay attention to those details. There's a children's Sunday school teacher meeting at 8 a.m. on the 18th. So please be there if you are a part of that. A lot of other good things that are going on. Please look through the bulletin and know how our church is serving and the events that are going on and plug in as best you can. All right, with all that said, we're done with announcements. So let's direct our attention to the screens for a brief video and then we'll spend some time praying together.
Folks, I believe the words in those videos, in that video, and we need to spend time this Independence Day thanking the Lord for our country, thanking the Lord for what he has done in this nation and for this nation, but also spend time praying legitimately for our nation, that God would move amongst us once again, that God would do a work in this nation, that God would use us to grow his kingdom. And so as we start out our service today, I, I want to invite us all to just spend some time praying over our nation. And, and I, I want you to do that from the depths of your heart. I want you to do that in sincerity. If that means you bow where you are there in the pew, that's great. If you feel led to come down and use these stairs down here as an altar, then come down and let us plead with the Lord over our nation. We'll spend some time praying individually. And then Jason is going to close out that time by leading us to prayerfully sing God Bless America. And I know you've heard the song, God Bless America, all the time, every 4th of July. But this year, pay attention to the lyrics. It is a prayer asking that God would bless America, this land that we love. And so let's move into a time of putting away all the troubles and, and worries of the week and dedicating our hearts, our minds, our souls to praying for this great nation. Will you join me in prayer? And then Jason will close us. praying as you were singing. Now, as we turn our attention to singing and praising the Lord, 
I was trying to find the patriotic song that said, through eternal ages, let his praises ring. But I couldn't find that patriotic song in the hymn book because it's standing on the promises. But the whole time I was thinking, what is that patriotic song? Because it's marched like, and then I said, okay, that's where we're going, Lord, standing on the promises. So we're going to sing standing on the promises, and I was just going to say there's no other way to sing standing on the promises but stand. So you're all up, and you're ready to roll, so let's sing together. And I might mess this up because we're singing two verses in the chorus, and then the last two verses in the chorus, okay? So just try to roll with me, because I'm going to probably sing a chorus after that first verse. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you it's very possible all the ones that come on Wednesday night know how many times I've messed that up when I said two verses in a chorus. But I'm going to do it today. I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it through two verses without singing the chorus. Yeah! yeah. Thank you, Wesley. <laughs> Woo! Here we go. And I can't, I can't play this march like I always go bluegrass, so just deal with it. You, you're going to be fine. It still sings the same, I think. All right, here we go. Let's sing. I'm standing on the promises. things to say. Just, I wanted to clue you in on them. I was going through a uh, devotional this week, and I, I got hooked up with Isaiah 43. And it, and I, it was just a snippet, just a verse out of there. Then I started reading the whole chapter. I said, man, God, that is so good. I'm just going to share, not the whole chapter, but just a few things. And I, just like I needed to hear this this week, I, I'm sure there's somebody out there that needs to, to hear this. This is what the Lord says uh, in Isaiah 43. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, your mind. Does anybody need to hear that this morning? Boy, I sure did this week. The Lord goes on to say, I will be with you. And this is what kind of got me into this next song, okay? Because it reminded me of God leads us along. He goes, I will be with you when you pass through the waters, when you pass through the rivers. They will not overwhelm you. You will not be scorched when you walk through the fire, and the flame will not burn you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, and your Savior. And he goes on to say, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. Boy, when I read that, God said, I love you, Jason. Does anybody else need to hear that? God say, I love you. And you can just put your name there. Do not fear, I am with you. And uh, I, I read through the whole chapter, and the, uh, some of the last few verses, and I really need to hear this. The Lord says, I... I sweep away your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. And then when I read these next couple of verses, I said, my goodness, it, it was just so neat to see this this week. The Lord says, remind me, let's argue the case together. He's going to argue your case. Just 
remind me, the Lord said, recount the facts so that you may be vindicated. So that you may be vindicated. And I don't know, for some reason I re reread th that this morning. And wh why do we need to be reminded of the facts? I went to Romans 8. God's going to talk through this with you. Why do we need to be reminded? Man, why did I, I can't even get to Romans fast enough. Where is it? It's in the New Testament, Romans 8. Because he said, that, why do I need to be reminded? Because he says, no, in all these things, you are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus the Lord. Remind me, the Lord said to me this week, remind me, Jason, let's talk through it together so you can remember the Lord Jesus Christ's love he has for you and the blood that he shed for you. Did anybody need to hear that this morning? Amen. Boy, I needed to hear that this week, and I just wanted to share with you this morning. So we have three more songs. I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm glad I kept it in the Word because when I start talking, we start chasing rabbits. So would you stand? We're going to sing three more songs together, and I pray that these will bless your heart like it blessed mine. I hope you know this old hymn. It sure is a good one. In shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet. In shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Sometimes on the mount where the sun shines so bright, God leads his dear children along. Sometimes in the darkest of night God leads his dear children along some through the water some through the flood some through the fire but all through the blood some through great sorrow but God gives a song in the night season and all going what you're doing he's for you he's not against you he's going to raise you up let's sing this great song together we're going to proclaim how great our god is let's sing together the splendor of the king Oh, we'll see how great, how 
Thank you so much for worshiping. You can be seated as our ushers go ahead and make their way down. I just want to give you a brief reminder that we don't just worship at Bethany by singing songs from our heart. We worship in multiple ways, our prayers, our songs, the preaching, and even this portion of our service where we give back to the Lord and to his kingdom. So would you please pray over how you might give sacrificially to support the Lord and the work he's doing through Bethany. My gracious Heavenly Father, it is my prayer that you would forgive us each of us of our sins and our shortcomings, even our failures, Lord. And each day you give each one of us, Lord, that we would be more Christ-like in our words, our deeds, even our thoughts, Lord, because you and you alone are to be honored to be praised and to be worshipped because you are the resurrected living son of the living father and you and you alone are holy. Lord, it's my prayer that you would not turn your back upon America, that you would awaken us, Lord, and draw us back to you. And if we give back to you that which is thine, all of it's yours, Lord, but you only say some that we would use it for your honor and your glory. For it's in your precious holy name I pray. Amen.
Man, oh man, thank you, Miss Pat, for that wonderful and patriotic offertory. That was beautiful. It is now at this time that I would like to invite all of our kids, ages three to five, all our preschoolers, to be dismissed for Children's Church. You can follow Miss Jessica right down that door. Caitlin, you know there's an age limit, right? Three, three to five. I got really tickled while Miss Pat was uh, playing the offertory. I, I had every intention, every intention, because Jessica, this is her month to help out with Children's Church. I had every intention of getting up here and saying, man, I believe that's the best looking Children's Church worker I've ever seen. She leans over and I felt this sharp jab in my side. I hadn't, I hadn't told her I was gonna do this at all, but my wife knows me so well. She leans over and she goes, don't say a word about me as I go to Children's Church. I was like, how did she know? It's amazing. But that was a really good looking children's church worker. I'm just gonna tell y'all. Tell you what, best looking children's church worker we got. I'm just, I'm a little biased, but that's my opinion. Oh man. And I, man, Jason, thank you so much for leading us this morning. I, I tell you, that man, whether there's a full band available, if our volunteer's up here to help him, whether he's up here by himself, whether it's him and Miss Pat, boy, doesn't he just lead us to the throne room of grace. Man, thank you, brother. God bless you. you. Do such a wonderful job. Such a wonderful job. Well, let's pray together and then we will turn our attention to the word of the Lord. Will you bow with me as we pray? <coughs> Father in heaven, we come to this moment in our worship service. And just like every moment before this, we seek in these moments to bring glory and honor to your name and your name alone. <coughs> Lord, this is not about some preacher. This is not about my words, Father. And if, if what happens in the coming moments is me speaking my words, then we have wasted everyone's time this morning. So, Lord, I, I pray and I ask as humbly as I know how that you would speak in spite of me. That, Father, you would move a weak and foolish servant out of your way and that from your holy and sacred word, you would teach us all together. God, your word is mighty and powerful. And we ask that you would encourage us, that you would challenge us. Father, that you would convict us where we need conviction. Lord, that you would comfort us where we need comforting. We love you, Father. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Folks, I, I hope you know that we, we pray like that before we begin our sermon each week because we believe in the power of prayer. I, I know that I'm not a very effective communicator and I know that God is able to speak in spite of me. And we believe that if we ask the Lord that, that he will show up. And I, I just want to take a brief moment. There are a lot of people here that I'm not going to point out and ask them to stand, but people that have written down prayer requests and put them in the offering plate and asked for prayer. God heard those prayers and in his grace, he has responded. There are people sitting here today that should have died from COVID. There are people sitting here today who got very sick with COVID. There are people sitting here today who had cancer that God delivered them through. There are people here today who were praying for a better job situation for years and God recently delivered and showed up. We pray before the sermon because we believe in the power of prayer. And if you are still waiting for your breakthrough, Keep praying, keep asking, keep hoping. If we're still waiting for a breakthrough for our nation, keep praying, keep asking, keep hoping because our God delivers on his word. Amen? Amen. That was, that was extra. You didn't you no extra charge for that. That was just a free sidebar. Well, if you have your copy of the word with you, I encourage you to take it and turn with me to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. 
The book of Daniel will be in chapter 2. I encourage you to take your own Bibles, but if you don't have one, feel free to borrow one from the back of the pew in front of you. If you don't own your own copy of God's Word, feel free to take that copy off the back of the pew as your own, and we'll replenish it. If you have a phone or a tablet, or if you just want to follow along on the screens, all of those things are perfectly acceptable. This morning, I wrestled with the Lord quite a bit on how much of this passage to read, and what ended up happening is we're going to read a long, longer passage than we've ever read for our sermon up until this point while I've been here. And so I say this with all sincerity, if you are physically able, please stand out of reverence for the public reading of God's holy word, as we will be looking at the first 45 verses of Daniel chapter 2. We'll be moving quickly, so buckle up and let's begin. Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. The, then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldean said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went into in Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, 
and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, no. No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have, more than all of the living, but in order that the interpretation may be known to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, and the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found but the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth this was the dream now we will tell the king its interpretation you O king the king of kings to whom the god of heaven has given the kingdom the power and the might and the glory into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell the children of man the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens making you rule over them all you are the head of gold another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you and yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth and there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation sure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We come to Daniel chapter two, and there's a lot that is taking place before, during, and after this chapter. Daniel is an incredible man of the Lord. He's been taken exile out of his home country, and he is living in the city of Babylon. He is living among the rulers, the wise men of Babylon. And so when we find Daniel here in chapter 2, there's a great task that is set before him. Interpret a dream or die. Daniel is a picture of what it looks like when a person does not have their own personal autonomy to a great extent. And it's interesting, we come to Daniel chapter 2 in the midst of a season in our nation where personal autonomy rules the day. Now, we've always been a nation about autonomy, self-determination. 
I can choose for myself. I decide for myself. This is autonomy. Think, for example, that we are an autonomous church. We're in friendly cooperation with the Southern Baptist Convention, but the Southern Baptist Convention is not like other denominations. It does not hold hierarchy or power over us other than to say you are no longer in fellowship with us. We join together with other like-minded churches for the sake of spreading the gospel. We join together with other like-minded churches, but those churches have no control over what we do, how we preach, who's in this pulpit, how we spend the money that is given, how we advance the kingdom of God. We are autonomous, right? We determine for ourselves what we will do. And autonomy rules the day in our current society. Now, this is what our nation was founded on, so it's not like it's out of the blue. It's not like it's out of nowhere. Remember, no taxation without representation, right? You people across this ocean, y'all aren't going to govern us. You can't govern us. We're going to govern ourselves. The very fabric and foundation of our nation, of the United States of America, is autonomy, right? In 1860, the southern states decided we're not going to be a part of this union anymore. We're going to secede and form our own nation. Again, autonomy was at an all-time high. I want to govern myself. I don't want that foreign person governing me. They live all the way in Washington, D.C. They don't know. They don't understand. I want to govern myself. And what we've done is we've taken that from a national level and we've taken it to the most extravagant and extreme extent and applied it individually. I determine what I do. I determine who I am. I determine who I love. I determine what my gender is. I determine where I go to school. I determine everything about my life. I determine whether I want to have a child right now or I don't want to have a child right now. I determine for myself what is right and what is wrong, and no one will have say-so over my personal autonomy. Does this sound familiar? This is the landscape of our nation today, and it is very different from the landscape of the nation of Babylon. Daniel had no say-so in whether or not he would go to Babylon. Well, I I take that back. He did get to decide whether he would go to Babylon or die. His choice was very straightforward. And so they captured him and took him to a foreign nation. Daniel never makes it back to Jerusalem. Daniel never makes it back to Judah. He lives the rest of his life as an exile, praying daily that God would take him back. Well, that's just, that's just not fair. That's just not right. Daniel should have been able to go where he wanted to go. Daniel should have been able to live where he wanted to live. Daniel should have been able to do what he wanted to do. I don't know. That's just awful. It's terrible today, right? But Daniel made the most of it. He made the most of it in his own way. He said, I'm going to live and I'm going to be in exile. I'm going to ask to go home, but I'm going to live in this nation to the best of my ability. I'm going to give up my own personal autonomy. I'm not going to try to sneak away. I'm not going to try to escape. I'm going to dwell here among these people, but I'm going to fight for the prosperity of this nation, this city. I'm going to fight for the prosperity of protecting even the other enchanters who were worshiping false gods. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And Daniel could decide once again to be killed or to step up and act. So he steps up and he acts. But isn't it amazing that God gave the vision to Nebuchadnezzar? Like, how crazy is it that of all the holy people, God gives the vision not to Daniel, but to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of a pagan nation. Nebuchadnezzar is the reason that the temple that Solomon built is destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar is the reason that the city of Jerusalem that God established through King David, he is the reason that that city has been burned. He and his nation and his empire are who God raised up just to do that. This is a man 
who by all accounts is against the Lord, right? And yet God gives a vision of the future to him. And he's smart enough to know that these people have been lying to him. Did you pick up on that? He's smart enough to understand that the people who've been coming to him have been giving him nothing but good news. Every time he tells them a dream, like, oh man, it means that Babylon's gonna be great. You guys, like, let me just tell you how good things are gonna get in Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar's like, yeah, you know, the, the news is always good. You know, we watch the news today and the news is always bad. Nebuchadnezzar was in the complete opposite situation. He was over there going, every time I tell them a dream, every time I ask for a prophecy, it's always positive. It's always good. Nebuchadnezzar was going to Joel Osteen's church every Sunday. It was happy, it was upbeat, and everything was good, right? Well, Nebuchadnezzar got tired of all the happy, upbeat, prosperous prophecies because they didn't always seem to be right or accurate. So he asks something impossible. You tell me the dream first, then you tell me how to interpret it. And all the guys are like, <laughs> you're just messing with us. He's like, now you're stalling for time. You tell me the dream or not like a, a nice, you'll be put to jail. Not like a, I'm gonna throw you in that dungeon till I forget about you. No, 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 no. I'm gonna tear you limb from limb. Then I'm gonna go to your house and I'm gonna burn it to the ground. Tell me the dream or die. And then they get really scared and really nervous. There's just, there's just nobody. And, then, and like the whole, like there's, that's never happened. Like I could go show you the record books. The King of Kings, this is not possible. Like we're all about to die. You ain't gonna have no wise men left. He's like, guess I won't have no more wise men. Y'all about to die. Ariok, King of the Guard, boom. Take care of them. Get rid of all of them. Every wise man. Well, Daniel was part of the wise men because Daniel was very wise. If you read chapter one, he's elevated to this position because of some of the choices that God leads him to. And so he goes to Daniel, and I just love that God gives Daniel the interpretation and the dream after prayer. Daniel hears what's going on and says, you go make me an appointment with the king. I gotta go pray with my buddies. And he prays. He prays with who we know better as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those four men pray, and that night, God shows Daniel the dream and the interpretation. Just another brief reminder, God answers prayers. God shows up. Trust in him, he'll always be on time. Now, his on time and my on time might be different, but he's always on time. And so now Daniel goes to give the interpretation to King Nebuchadnezzar. You know something that's happened over the last year? We've had a lot of people pretending to be Daniel. I don't have Facebook, okay? But even as somebody not on Facebook, I could not get away from the endless prophecies about how Donald Trump really would win the presidency, about how he's probably still president right now, about how a day's coming where we're going to have martial law and we're going to reinstall Trump into the office, about how COVID would go away, about how COVID was all this and all that and all the other. And these people who said, I dreamed a dream and I believed and I saw, and then they got this huge following. And now where are they? All these same preachers, all these same pastors that promised us all these things that they saw and God told them and it was true. Unfortunately, according to what we learn in Deuteronomy, because their prophecies did not come true, those prophecies were not of God. Those men and women making those prophecies fall into the camp of all of the wise men who were about to be torn limb from limb because they lied to King Nebuchadnezzar nonstop. And in the context of a great peril in this nation, the king being greatly disturbed, God gave the vision not to the holiest of holies. He gave the vision to Nebuchadnezzar. Sometimes God works in really unexpected ways. And yet sometimes you and I look to the tried and true ways. We're trapped in the box and we believe everything everybody says to us. And I know it's challenging. If you spend an hour watching YouTube videos, you could believe that the earth is flat. It's possible. It has happened to people before. You watch enough on the internet and then boom, you're a flat earther. And then boom, the towers at September 11th, they were just knocked over for insurance purposes and the government knew the whole time. They paid the terrorists to come and do it. Like, be careful. That happens. 
to real, normal, rational people. But in this case, we need to be more discerning like Nebuchadnezzar was. There's very few times in life I'm going to tell you to be like a Babylonian king. But I believe that Scripture instructs us that we must have the wisdom that Nebuchadnezzar had to discern what is from God and what is not from God. So then Daniel gets the dream and the interpretation, goes in and tells King Nebuchadnezzar. And I love what happens. This statue, right, with the gold, with the silver, with the bronze, with the iron, the clay and the iron mixed. And then this big rock cut out of a mountain that no human could have cut comes and smashes it all. And then the rock becomes an enormous mountain that takes up every corner of the earth. This dream has ramifications even for us today. That's why it's recorded in Scripture. Because it plays out in the empires of Babylon. You, you have empires that are raised and destroyed. And the point of the dream, the point of the passage, is that it is God who raises up nations and crushes them. It is just as easy for God to raise up a nation or to crush a nation as it is for him to speak a whole nother galaxy into existence. It's nothing to the Lord. He is all powerful and in control. He is sovereign and on his throne. No nation succeeds without the Lord causing it or allowing it. So directly or indirectly, God is involved in every nation that rises and falls. And that's part of the point of this dream. God is the one who raised up Assyria when Israel, the northern nation of Israel, after their civil war, God raises up Assyria to punish Israel in the north. But then Assyria was doing atrocious things. So God raises up Babylon and crushes Assyria. And as Babylon is raised up, he raises up the Greeks to crush the Babylonians. And then he raises up the Romans to crush the Greeks and the Persians. Then the Romans fall in on themselves. That's, that's part of the interpretation of this dream, is that God is the one who established Nebuchadnezzar and made him that head of gold. God is the one who will establish the nation that comes after Babylon. God is the one who will establish the nation that comes after Greece. God is the one who will establish the nation after Rome. But in the time of the Roman Empire, something's going to happen. There's going to be a rock that's cut out of a mountain, a cornerstone, if you will not cut by any human hand, and it will rise up and it will crush flat the whole statue. And it's all in pieces. This is not another nation. This is not the United States of America. This rock is not any European nation. It's not China, it's not Russia. This rock is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will rise up and permeate all nations. There will be a people that rises up that understands their primary citizenship is not in a specific land of free and home of brave. Their citizenship first and foremost is in this kingdom that will be established as an everlasting mountain and will never be conquered. This is the kingdom of God. The Lord is the one who will establish this. This is not the only place that he talks about it. Turn with me to Psalm 47. Psalm 47. Psalm 47 says, Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. No matter what king, what president, what prime minister, what elected official, dictator, or otherwise, the Lord is the great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under his feet. He subdued nations under his feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For the God, for God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. He reigns over the nations. He reigns over all nations. I love this country we live in. 
I am American to the core. I bleed red, white, and blue. I'm as patriotic as patriotic gets. I love living in the United States of America. We have been blessed beyond what we comprehend, and I'm a spoiled United States brat, just like every other one of us who live in the lap of luxury compared to the rest of the world, even the poorest of us. I am a tried and true believer in the United States of America, but at the end of the day, God Almighty reigns over the United States of America. God reigns over Great Britain, over all the nations in the European Union, over Russia, over China, over North Korea, South Korea, Cuba, and everything in between. God reigns over all nations. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. God. Do you understand that if we take that analogy to today, the shields of the earth, the satellite nuclear missile defense systems belong to the Lord. The horse and the chariot will not save, other Psalms tell us. Nuclear missiles will not save. A great economy will not save. A new president will not save. God is the owner of all the shields. God is the one who is on the throne. He is highly exalted. I find it really ironic that at the beginning of Psalm 47, we're told that this is a song of the sons of Korah. Do you remember a few weeks back when we talked about another psalm from the sons of Korah? These are people who are submitting to God's authority in their life, submitting their own personal autonomy over to the Lord, and they are the very people who rebelled. Their ancestors rebelled against Moses and Aaron, who God had established and appointed. These are the descendants of the people who revolted against Moses and Aaron, and fire from the altar consumed some of them. The earth swallowed some others, and then these are the ones who learned their lesson and they were descended down. Isn't it ironic that the Psalm, Psalm 47, about submitting to the great king over all nations was written by the descendants of those who rebelled against the great king of all nations. Folks, something we have to remember on an Independence Day is that God is in control. He declares the end from the beginning. He's the one who establishes nations and tears them down. The greatness that we have in the United States is not owed to Donald Trump, to Joe Biden, to George Washington, to Abraham Lincoln, or anybody else along the way other than the Lord who allows us to be a great nation. Donald Trump is not able to make America great again. The only one able to make America great the first time, the second, the 50th, is the Lord God Almighty. And if you're looking to Donald Trump to come back into the presidency and save America, you have put your hope in the wrong place. God is the one who declares the end from the beginning. He's the one who spoke to King Nebuchadnezzar and said, here's how long your nation's going to last. Here's who's coming after you. Here's who's coming after them. Here's who's coming after them. And then I'm going to establish my kingdom and it will go over all the earth. Q Anon cannot predict what's about to happen. Only the Lord God Almighty can predict what is about to happen. Our nation is not in ruins because of one president, because of one political party, but because of the Lord. Whether he wants it to be in ruins or wants it to be famous, wants it to be great, wants it to be horrible, wants our economy to thrive, wants our economy to be absolutely nothing so that we struggle and we feel choked and suffocated. The Lord does it or allows it. That's where our hope has to be. And if it is in anyone else or any political party, we're in just as hopeless a situation as the wise men who couldn't tell Nebuchadnezzar his dream. Folks, God is the one who declares the end from the beginning. And when we think that this world is only about the United States, we have failed miserably. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 7. I fall victim personally to these things. I'm telling you, this is where my heart is and what God has convicted me of leading into Independence Day. 
And I have to remind myself constantly of Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 12. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. A multitude that no one could number. No one could number. From every nation, every nation, from all tribes, from all peoples, from all languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hand, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This does not say that there was a great multitude of people from the United States of America and then like a handful from the rest of the world. And, and there was like one person from this one tribe and one person. There was a great multitude that was uncountable. Do you know the Lord knows every star? He knows every grain of sand. He knows every hair on our head. But this multitude is uncountable. This is every nation, every tribe, every tongue. Folks, this is our kingdom, not the United States. I'm so grateful for what God has done in this country, but this is our citizenship. This is our kingdom. Every nation, every tongue, every tribe, every person. And how many times do I find myself personally more offended or insulted when something happens to our nation than when something happens in the kingdom of God? This past week, I found myself enraged that an Olympic athlete, even in a qualifying round, even though they're protesting that the, what, all, all that's going on, that one of our athletes representing our nation, even in a qualifier, would turn their back on the flag in the midst of the Star Spangled Banner playing, wouldn't stand on the podium. I was furious. I didn't take time to read the rest of the story. I didn't, I didn't know what else was going on. And honestly, I didn't care. I was angry. I was hurt in a sinful way. I was angry with this person. I felt that that was disrespectful to our nation, disrespectful to our flag. But if I'm honest with you, I don't know that I've been that angry when one of my brothers or sisters is thrown in jail because they were preaching the gospel. I found myself going to persecution.com. It's a website by Voice of the Martyrs. And I looked up, and the first 24 people that it lists on their websites in Iran, in China, in Russia, all over the country, North Korea, all of these people who are imprisoned for the name of Jesus have been imprisoned for years, and I didn't even know half their names. I knew one name. I knew one name. Yusef Narkani, he's being held in prison in Iran and has been for years because he refused to back down from preaching the gospel. And I'm over here offended that somebody turned their back on a silly flag. I love our nation, but why don't I care when Christ is insulted the same level? Why am I more upset about when my political, uh, political affiliation is offended or my delicate sensibilities are touched? But folks, I got to be honest with you. Some of us here in the South are probably more willing to go fight and die for the United States than we are to go share the gospel with somebody lost and condemned to hell. And that's the God's honest truth. And it's not about this nation. We will be well represented in Revelation 7, 9. I believe it. But where's the rest of this kingdom? Where's the rest of our brothers and sisters? And why don't we care as much about them as we do about our own nation, our own flag, our own military? Why do I get so fired up over these things and over here personally? I didn't even know but one name of a brother in Christ who's sitting and rotting in jail real time, right now. I don't get anywhere near this offended 
when somebody takes communion lightly or doesn't care about baptism, when people speak poorly of God. I don't get furious like I did when that lady turned her back on the flag. Look, autonomy is a great thing. Patriotism is a great thing. But it is a really crummy God. There is one God. He declares the end from the beginning. He establishes nations and takes them down. And even in the midst of Daniel's nation being destroyed, God preserved Daniel and used him in another nation. Folks, we've got to start caring a lot more about what God's doing with us, in us, and through us. We've got to start caring a lot more about God's kingdom than our country. And I say that because that's my heart and that's my struggle. And so maybe that's not you this morning, but I'm telling you, that's how God's word convicted me. Because a lot of times I find myself making patriotism a really poor idol. And I want to confess before you this morning that I'm going to start caring a lot more about God's kingdom than what that flag does. I want my allegiance in that flag. I want my allegiance in that cross. And I want this to be secondary. And this Independence Day, I'm telling you, I've been more concerned about my freedom in this country than I have been in my freedom in Christ. I can't answer for you, but where do you stand? Have you fallen victim to all of the false prophets? Do you need to seek after the wisdom of Nebuchadnezzar and find God in his word? Have you fallen victim to caring a lot more about our country than about the kingdom of Christ? Where do you stand this morning? How will we respond? Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, we love you. We, we only have a nation that we love so deeply because of you. God, I, I don't want to have no pride in my country or my nation. I don't want to unplug and just ride along. But, but Father, I, I, I got to admit, I, I've had my priorities mixed up. Lord, would you help us and cause us to remember daily that this is not our home. Help us, Lord, not to get caught up in all the political gimmicks and games and prophecies and craziness, Father, that the evil one is trying to tempt us into. Lord, help us to be patriotic secondarily. Help us to love and fight for this nation, but only second to how we love and fight for your kingdom. God, we love you. We need your help to do this. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, to you, God, our Father in heaven. Amen. Church, would you stand? Would you sing as Jason leads us? Would you respond as the Holy Spirit moves on your heart? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Hold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own. Yeah.
Church, thank you so much for being here. I know I say it often, but when you come and you worship, you add something to our experience of worship that no one else can add. So thank you for being here. Thank you for bearing with me. I know I ran long. I, it, you know, I run long every Sunday, it seems like, but this was especially long. Thank you for bearing with me. That's just what the Lord had on my heart. I know that you all have places to go and family to see. Be safe if you get out on that lake today. All right, enjoy Independence Day. May God bless you. Let me pray for us. Jason will lead us in doxology, and I hope you'll have a great, happy 4th of July afternoon. Father in heaven, God, you've blessed us in ways we, we can't begin to number. Thank you, Lord. As humbly as we know how, would, would you please, we ask, would you please continue to bless us? Would you keep us? Would you make your face to shine upon us? Would you turn your countenance towards us? Grant us your mercy, your favor, and your peace. We ask all these things in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's sing as we're dismissed. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Have a great afternoon.